Welcome to the Page One Podcast, a twice-weekly podcast featuring a variety of guests and thought leaders on topics ranging from channel strategies to tariffs, influencer marketing, best-in-class product launches, and all the details about how to accelerate your e-commerce sales with the big box retailers, or what we call R-Commerce. Now, here's your host, Luke Peters. Thanks for joining us on the Page One Podcast. I'm your host, Luke Peters, CEO of Newer Appliances and Retail Ban Digital Strategy Agency. Right now, we're in a coronavirus world, and I know that is on everyone's mind, so I'm going to adapt all of these interviews to ensure that you, the listeners, are getting the most out of the Page One Podcast. You can expect us to get right to the point and provide valuable business insights with a focus on COVID-19 impacts and how business leaders are succeeding and transitioning in this time of change. Um, quickly right now I'm offering a free evaluation of your online sales strategy. If you're interested, uh, find me on LinkedIn or email me at Luke at retailband.com. In this episode, you are going to learn from John Brunquell on COVID-19 impacts of the egg industry. What are specialty eggs and what it takes to sell and grow inside retailers right now. And I'm excited to do this interview with John because I actually had chickens in my backyard when I was growing up. We have a crazy story growing up in Orange County. We had a big family, chickens, corn, pot belly pigs, uh, lizards, and all kinds of other stuff in our backyard. Um, all kinds of tomatoes and, you know, almost every vegetable you can name and a ton of fruits as well. So, um, a farmer at heart without living on a farm. Uh, but anyways, let's get back to John. John spent his entire career in the egg industry, founding egg innovations in the 1990s. He saw early on that more nature you made a hen's environment, the happier and more productive she is. John's a board member or officer of multiple industry associations, including the Organic Egg Farmers of America. So John, I think that's a good description and good starter, but why don't you add it a little bit more and just tell the audience briefly about your business. Sure, sure. Glad to be here this afternoon, Luke. Um, the first two titles I'll put on that are the most important are our father and husband. Um, but as we move forward into egg innovations, um, we founded that in 99. I grew up on a family farm. And uh, in the 80s and 90s, I could espouse all the uh, benefits of cages. And then somewhere along the way in the 90s, I walked into my first cage-free barn and it kind of destroyed my perspective of um, cages. And so I began a, a journey of learning on what animal welfare is and, and more from a science point of view. And along the way, I've, be, I've uh, I run as a CEO of the, the largest free-range and pasture egg operation in the nation. We have about a million and a half birds out on pasture every day. Wow, that's awesome. Um, and, and truly, I am excited to talk about this. I mean, we have a lot of our audience, you know, obviously we're shopping and shopping is totally different now, right in the middle of COVID-19. Um, eggs always seem to be in short supply. But, um, but I think there's a lot of interest in finding out, you know, what the difference, and we'll get into these questions, you know, free range versus, you know, organic or versus natural. You have all these things. And as consumers, um, you know, we want to eat healthy, but we also want to kind of do the right thing for the environment, especially when the, uh, the cost isn't so much more to do that. So we'll get into all those questions because I know they're going to be interesting for the audience. But why don't we start with coronavirus and uh, tell us how it's impacting your business? So the, the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic of 2020 has been a uh, uh, significant challenge in our industry as it's been in virtually every other industry. Um, speaking first to the total industry of, of shell eggs, uh, at first we went through a, a hoarding phase at retail uh, for the first two weeks uh, when people really uh, were scared. And, and there was, as an example, uh, whatever my baseline volume of business was, orders came in at 300% of that uh, volume for two weeks in a row. Um, and, and so what we found was concurrently grocery st or, uh, retail while they lifted food service shut down. So it was never an issue when there were eggs not on shelf that we didn't have enough total eggs in the industry. The issue was the supply chain wasn't geared up to have that massive of a shift to retail, uh, in such a short period of time. So that was the first leg of it. And then that took about two weeks. 
And now we're in the next four weeks uh, post hoarding and we're seeing a very sustained about 40 to 50 percent lift over traditional volume. Um, and I suspect that will stay at that level until the stay at home quarantines are, are lifted. And that really transcends whether it's the premium eggs like our free range and pasture or even commodity eggs. Well, wow, so now, so you're seeing a 40% increase and is, I'm just going to guess and extrapolate, is that because, you know, pre-crisis people were eating out at the, not eating the premium eggs and now they're eating at home and they're buying the premium eggs. So that positively impacts your sales? Correct. And then think of all the other places people use eggs. Um, secondary education, high schools, uh, cruise lines, you know, just with the entire shutdown of um, the recreational world, casinos, um, all of these places were end users of eggs. And so that side of the business dropped as much as 90% for some people. And as they stayed at home, you know, all of a sudden they're feeding their children uh, a cooked breakfast because they're working at home. Uh, so very dramatic lifestyle changes have occurred, at least on the short term. That's really interesting. So actually, this crisis has actually positively impacted you and maybe other organic or natural food type of companies. Correct. And and, and in the egg industry, it's really two stories. If you are dominantly serving retail, which we do, it's been significantly positive, at least in the short term. If you dominantly serve uh, the food service sector, it's been significantly negative. Um, and, and very few companies just spread themselves evenly across both sectors. So it's really created a fair amount of division within the egg industry of, of I hate to say winners and losers, but uh, however you want to correctly phrase it. Yeah. And how does a company like yours ramp up production? I mean, so you have over a million and a half or mil- I think you said a million and a half hens, right? And you know, they're producing a certain amount of eggs a week. Now you got a 40% increase. Uh, I don't think they, are they just going to lay 40% <laughs> more eggs or like what was, what was happening with those eggs before the crisis? How does, how does it work? That's exactly right. Um, so the, the tagging was a little bit um, uh, beneficial because we were heading into an Easter holiday. So we were, as most of the egg industry, we were building up our inventory of eggs just because of a traditionally busy holiday for us. And, and the, you know, obviously the COVID superseded that. So we went into the pandemic with a large inventory, but that has since been entirely depleted. So uh, we are producing um, hand to mouth at this point. And because we do free range and pasture, uh, these are very thinly traded uh, markets. And because of our Blue Sky Family Farm brand, uh, meet certain multiple animal welfare standards. It's not like we can go out in the open market and uh, purchase eggs to cover orders. So quite honestly, for the last two weeks, uh, we've been shorting orders and uh, just, you know, having a constant communication with the retailers of what we're doing and, and trying to be fair about it. Um, but you are correct. The chickens are going to produce an egg a day, whether whether you need them or don't need them. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Cool. And then and kind of wrapping up the COVID part of this, how is this going to affect the industry long term? You know, there, there's going to be a, a number of longer term effects right now. Again, on the food service side, it's, it's a significant red ink. Uh, and so that part of the industry is, is adding more red ink onto about 18 months, two years of a poor egg market in general. Um, so uh, we would not be surprised, although we have no inside information that there may be uh, some some bankruptcies or con- some consolidation. Uh, we're going. We anticipate seeing a reduction in the uh, size of the national egg flock um, over the summer because of now very depressed prices. And then we think there'll be a rebound later in the fourth quarter. Wow. And then quickly before I get on to some questions about, I mean, I just got all kinds of things that I think are interesting, and then some other questions about eggs in general, but also about the business because that's also going to be important to the listeners. But before we do that, are you able to give kind of a a scale of the company? Maybe you can talk about acreage. You already talked about the number of hens. Um, We'll talk about acreage and maybe number of employees to give uh, listeners just a scope for the size. So with with Egg Innovations, we work with divisions, not entire companies, but divisions of all the nation's leading retailers. So we do 
divisions of Sam's, Walmart, Kroger, Safeway, Whole Foods, et cetera. Um, we do that through what we call an integrator model, where the family farmer owns the birds, uh, excuse me, owns the building, and we own the birds. And so we have 55 family farmers spread over five states. And in our free range egg production, we give the hens 22 square feet per bird outside. Uh, to put that in perspective, 20,000 hens get 11 acres. In our pastured operations, uh, that same 20,000 birds gets 50 acres. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, the, the birds are very much out on pasture using a fair amount of land. Um, and we have probably at this point 100 employees when you look at all of our operations. That is actually really awesome. So you have kind of this integrated model where you're integrated with all of these family farms. And um, is that because it's more f- your strength as a company is on the kind of branding distribution and supply chain side, and then that's where you can really tie in and help them? So the luxury of founding the company is I got to impart my my social values, if you will, on what Blue Sky Family Farms meant. And because I'm a third generation family farmer, my dad still lives on the homestead. Um, one of the things we like to see at Egg Innovations is to see another generation of farmers farming. And one of the things we could do at Egg Innovations is we could take away the volatility of the egg market and we could take away the volatility of feed costs and that way the family farmer could focus on you know production of eggs which they do incredibly well and so it's a very much a partnership Uh, we absorb risk that can be done at a remote level and the farmer is the on-site expert i mean they're in with the birds every day and so it's worked very well yeah i love it i think that's great and then you can probably grow Mm -hmm. quicker that way and and kind of increase your vision um, that way a a lot quicker than if you're having to buy all those acres yourself. That would be correct. I mean, yeah, we we certainly transfer some of the uh, capital intensiveness uh, over to the family farm. Are any portion of your sales online? Is that that something that can even happen with eggs or is this all, um, hopefully it doesn't sound like a dumb question, but a lot of our listeners are are selling online. I'm just curious how much can happen online or is it pretty much all in in in-store type of business? So we are uh, Whole Foods' largest private label vendor of eggs. And so indirectly, if you shop at Amazon for the 365 label, uh, you would be uh, purchasing our eggs. Uh, But we don't do any direct online ourselves. Got it. And what have you done as far as branding goes outside of just, you know, creating an amazing business with all the relationships with the partners, but is there anything special online that you guys have done is um, from a branding perspective, or is it mostly just been, um, you know, building the core values of the business through kind of your personal relationships with the different retailers? We're doing a, we're, we're just doing the research right now for a relaunch of the blue sky family farm marketing campaign. Uh, that's our, our flagship banner. And uh, at this point, we're just finishing up, you know, what's the media going to look like? What's the social going to look like? Uh, and, and so where we've been relatively quiet on the brand marketing, uh, that will step up here in the third and fourth quarters. Awesome. That's smart. And so why don't we get into a couple of questions around eggs? I know this is, a, you know, your passion is around this, and your brands around this. So we have uh, cage-free, pasture-raised, in free range. Uh, could you quickly share the differences and why they're worth the additional price? Sure. Cage-free is probably the most confusing term for a consumer. Uh, our, our data says that 83% of consumers hear cage-free but think free range. So, so cage-free, the birds are still entirely confined inside the barn, and they do not have an opportunity to go uh, outside. Uh, and so that's probably the biggest distinction we make over and over is educating consumers. If they're looking for hens that have the opportunity to go outside, cage-free does not meet that need. Um, free range is the next step up. And in free range, we're giving the birds 22 square feet per bird outside. We're having them outside until about 25 degree temperature in our northern climates. Um, And then we step up on the final phase to pasture. And pasture, the hens are out 365 days a year. We do that in our our southern uh, part of our footprint. And they also get uh, significantly more space again. They get 108 square feet uh, per bird. And so 
the cage free, the free range and the pasture are about the living conditions and then organic or non-GMO that's the feed that you can give to any type of that living condition. Oh, this is, no, this is awesome information. Now, if a bird is organic, now I know you're dealing with eggs and the, but if you know the answer, you know, regarding actual chicken and if people are buying the chicken meat, it, when they're talking about organic and antibiotics, are those, is organic also going to be free of antibiotics or what, what do the regulations allow in those cases? So the, the use of antibiotics in organic is, uh, It depends on the certifier, but I would say generally it is highly frowned upon. Uh, Generally, what they're going to say is if the birds are unhealthy, and and that's not a negative, it's like your child has the flu. Um, You know, if they're unhealthy, then treat them with antibiotics, but you take them off the organic program. Uh, The welfare of the hen is the most important thing uh, over staying with organic and and not treating your, your birds. Um, So in organic, that's going to be the purest form you get. You're going to have organic grain and then no drugs, hormones, or antibiotics. Okay, awesome. So let's put it all together. So it sounds like cage-free. Well, actually, before we get onto this, so you have cage-free, free range, and pasture. What percentage of the total egg market, though, do those three categories um, comprise? So in the United States, there's 330 million hens for the, what we call the national egg-laying flock, uh, roughly one hen for every person in the United States. Um, of that 330 million, uh, approximately um, 250 million are still in cages. Uh, cage-free at this point is up around uh, 70 million. And that's the biggest transition going on is, is every year cage production is uh, dwindling and cage free is replacing it uh, to the point that cage free will be the baseline commodity over the next several years. Free range is out of the remaining 10 million. Free range is about uh, eight to nine million of that. And pasture is about another two to three million. Oh, wow. OK, so you're talking three or four percent is going to be pasture and free range. Free range. Correct. They're, they're still of the total market at this point, they're still uh, collectively under 10%. Okay. And then quickly, like on the, on the health benefits, um, I don't know a ton about that. I know the shells are stronger on the um, cage free or pasture, but is, is there, I think you guys have done some research or do you know any research that tells, Hey, obviously, you know, we want the hens to be healthy and happy just um, for a bunch of reasons, but as far as actually eating the eggs, is there advantages on these, uh, pasture raise and free range? So the, the, the way we look at egg innovations, the, the fundamental premise that we have is that the, the good Lord hardwired every animal on this earth with certain behaviors, whether it's a monkey, a llama, a horse. And in the case of a chicken, it is hardwired to scratch, to perch, to dust bathe, to socialize. And, when, and our corollary to that thesis is And when you manage that animal consistently with the way it's hardwired, good things should happen. And that's exactly what we see. We we see lower mortality, lower morbidity, better feed conversion, and higher quality eggs. Thicker shells, deeper colored egg yolks. Um, And then certainly the environment has an influence on the nutritional profile where cage and cage-free production get a very... um, specific formulation of feed with free range and pasture, they're able to actually go out and uh, enjoy the pasture and that will transfer into their food. Great. And before we leave this topic, um, if someone is making the decision of cage free versus pasture raised or free range, how much of an advantage for the bird is it to be, I mean, obviously you, you laid out the different square feet, but is cage free really similar to the standard eggs already that are caged or is that is still a big step up if someone's buying a cage free um, egg for the for the hen's welfare I say sure so I would say that cage free is clearly a better world than cages and I grew up on a cage farm um, having said that we at egg innovation view it as one big cage instead of you know thousands of little cages um, and when I talk about the, you know, the five key, you know, behaviors of a hen, a cage free environment will allow them to perch, will allow them to dust bathe, uh, but it won't allow them to pasture, you know, and, and get outside and express native behavior. So it's a step in the right direction, but it's not a dramatic step. Cool. Makes a lot of sense. Okay. So then, you know, back to circling back to business 
talk about succeeding in grocers. Uh, you guys, you know, obviously you've grown a substantial business. You're working with a lot of the big chains. I think uh, Walmart, Kroger, uh, Whole Foods, and, and I'm sure many, many more. You know, how do you get fridge space um, and what else does it take to win in grocery? The dominant thing grocers really uh, value is the brand equity of their brand. So Kroger is going to worry about the Kroger label. You know, Whole Foods is going to worry about the Whole Foods label, et cetera. So the the first step is you, you have to have a product that simply has integrity. If you're going to play in the animal uh, welfare space, we like to say if there's guilt by association, there's credibility by affiliation. And by that, I mean, if, if, if you don't have a third party certifying and auditing your facilities, I would tend to be skeptical of any premium egg. Um, and then you have to be able to tell a coherent story. Why are you different? Why does this resonate with the consumer? And in our case, very clearly, we're seeing the younger generation, the millennials, are clearly altering the landscape. And so we are able to walk into a retailer. We're able to talk to them about uh, broad-based food trends, but then dial into the egg case. And then we're able to make uh, coherent recommendations for them of, you know, based on if you have four facings, you should have these four types of products. And, and clearly we're always going to advocate that at least one of them is, is our Blue Sky brand. Great. And is that, so for those listening, is Blue Sky sold in all of the retailers or is it just in Kroger? Yeah. So Blue Sky, you can find uh, in all the Krogers west of the Mississippi. You can find it in Whole Foods in about half the nation. Um, and then you can find it in, in major pockets like Chicago and other major areas. We do a lot of private label as well because one of our other goals is to take costs out of premium eggs. So we don't believe a dozen pasture eggs should cost seven dollars, and and so uh, probably fifty to sixty percent of our sales, we are um, the preferred choice of the retailer to pack their house brand. Awesome, that's great. And then, so a couple of other specific questions is, let's talk about salmonella. This is always a funny one. I'm sure a lot of guys um, can can hear that voice from their wife saying, "Don't touch the raw eggs," or "Wash your hands after touching the raw eggs." <laughs> And uh, what is the truth behind sal? I actually have a little background in, in microbiology, but I've never gotten sick from salmonella from <laughs> eggs. Um, I eat, uh, I handle them all. I love eggs, but I'm always eating them, usually hard boiled, but you know, omelets, everything else. What's the truth be ta- behind salmonella and touching raw eggs and even eating raw or eggs like a soft boiled egg? So we're going to follow the American Egg Board recommendations and, and that's never to eat a raw or, or uh, lightly cooked egg, but broadly there's a, you know, the United States has what's called the salmonella prevention program. So every egg company is required to have a multifactorial process of inhibiting uh, rodents. Uh, we, you know, we, we measure the, the density of, of uh, different vectors that potentially could cause salmonella. Uh, in our case, then we, uh, Every egg is treated with UV light when it goes through our plant. Um, so we, we as an industry take tremendous steps to uh, inhibit first and then kill anything that's on the shelf. But even with that, um, while I know it occurs at Egg Innovations, we could never recommend eating raw eggs or, or lightly cooked eggs uh, just because of the rare, rare chance that something could happen. Yeah, totally makes sense. You know, another question, when I was growing up, I remember I had a buddy and, you know, they wanted to get, buy an ostrich farm and ostriches were a big thing and they made these huge <laughs> eggs. Whatever happened to the ostrich market? Like how come the chicken, <laughs> the hen is the queen of the egg? You know, you've got all these, you got duck eggs, you've got ostrich eggs. They're, they're bigger. I've, I've had them both. And is it just because the, the chicken hen makes more of them at a more reasonable price? <laughs> I, I, I chuckle because as I sit here and talk at my desk, I have an emu egg, a deep green oh, blue egg that I'm looking at that they uh, engraved the Egg Innovations logo on. Um, to answer your question, it, it's just e- efficiency and economy. You know, the, the white egg and the brown egg laying hens are just prolific layers, and they do that at a very, very efficient level. So when you look at it from, you know, cost of protein or cost per serving, um, they, they simply are the, the 900 pound gorilla in the room of efficiency of any type of, of egg. 
Great. And, and we've talked a lot. I think we've covered a lot of things about bird welfare and we've talked about the different types, you know, cage free, pasture raised and free range. Um, I guess before I let you go, I, and, and it's funny cause I, I started with saying that, Hey, I grew up with chickens in the backyard, but again, I was a kid not doing much of the work except picking up the eggs. I think it is a trend that you hear even people in urban areas or, or, uh, you know, they'll have chicken coops. Um, talk about that trend. You know, what you see, is it, is it more, um, I can't imagine it's going to be uh, cost beneficial. You, you can still go buy a dozen eggs for even, even, uh, pasture raised for around five bucks, right. Or something like that. So is it, is it cost beneficial? Is it more because people like to have chickens at the house and it's fun and they can go out there and kind of have like a little mini family farm, or do you have any thoughts about, um, having chickens at the house? You know, the, the term I use in the industry, it's, it's, it's the backyard hobbyist. And, and that's really what it is. If, if you have a passion for hens, and you have a hobby, and um, you're you're getting a couple fresh eggs every morning for yourself. Uh, it's a wonderful way to look at it. Um, it's not going to be uh, economical compared to you know buying a dozen eggs at the grocery store. But again, when you have a hobby, you know economics is not necessarily the first priority. Yeah, totally. John, any other questions uh, that I didn't ask that you think might be interesting to the listeners? No, I thought we did a very good job of covering it. Probably the only other thing I would mention, just uh, just to show people the kind of the nature of how this industry is evolving. I actually graduate next in about three weeks from the University of Kentucky with a degree in avian ethology and avian ethology is bird behavior. Oh, wow. That degree didn't exist 15 years ago. And so that really talks to how much uh, welfare has moved the needle whether it's eggs or, or other animal products uh, over the last 15 years, clearly society is changing. Well, listen, I, I love capitalism, but I also love people that are doing what you're doing because we have to be sustainable too, you know, and we can't lose sight of that. And also, um, you know, food is medicine. So we have to have healthy food for the whole country actually. And hopefully you can continue doing what you're doing and that can expand into other industries. So want to really thank you again for being on the page one podcast, but before I let you go, how can listeners find more about you, learn more about your company? Um, what's the best way to do that? Uh, visit our website at egginnovations.com or our branded website at blue sky family farms. And you can also find us on Facebook and LinkedIn. And we'll have all those in the show notes for the listeners. Um, and this will be obviously on all the typical podcast uh, locations, iTunes, Spotify, and on the Retail Band podcast page. I want to thank everybody for listening to this episode of the Page One podcast sponsored by Retail Band. Hope you enjoyed the interview today. Really appreciate your reviews on iTunes and hope you'll join us for the next interview. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Page One podcast with Luke Peters. If you like our show and want to know more, check out our other segments. Also, please help us out by leaving us a rating on iTunes. Want to learn more about our commerce? Check out www.retailband.com to get more great tips and tricks on how to accelerate your e-commerce sales with the big box retailers.